chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul deals with the church of Corinth, of the Corinthians, the gospel of Christ's resurrection. He deals with them. And if I were to put a title on today's message, I would say love and forgiveness is the crown jewel of salvation. Love and forgiveness is the crown jewel of salvation. You see, there are many fruits of the Spirit. There are many things that are happening today. And I found out, out of all the things that are happening, the only thing that can bring us back to the reality that we're living in is love and forgiveness. And I found out that when you talk about a crown jewel, or what they call a tycoon cut, simply means that one diamond is on top of another. And it's set in a way in which will transform light when light hits it. Love and forgiveness can do that. Where when we love somebody, we'll go all out of our way to make peace and to get along. But there are things that people do to us that almost make us want to lose our mind. And it's hard to forget. But when we learn that Love and forgiveness, and I'm going to use the F word over and over again, and it's not the cussing F word, it's the F word to forgive. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. To forgive and to try to get over it, somebody say build a bridge, build a bridge. and get over it. Get over. Now some people don't want to be on no bridge. Uh, they, want, they, you know, they want to keep things going and keep things happening. They want to get mad and stay mad until the sun go down. But the Bible teaches us, uh, let not the wrath go down before the sun go down. You know, we, uh, we need to seek peace and pursue it. Now, I'm not saying it's easy now, because you got some people that are bent backwards or bent out of shape. If it means they ain't having a good day, they ain't going to let you have one. But love and forgiveness, if you understand it, if we receive it by faith as a gift of grace. Everybody say receive it, receive it. By, faith by faith as a gift of grace. Gift of grace. You see, love truly can move people when nothing else can. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 1, and I'm going to jump. Uh, I'm going to read up to verse 11, and I'm going to jump way up to verse 51. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1. Paul wanted them to be reassured about Christ's resurrection. But he realized that salvation had to be put in place. You and I ought to thank God today for salvation. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Do you know without salvation where you would be and where your mind would be? what God would do or allow to happen in this world. And if it wasn't for the angels that are patrolling the world, uh, uh, if it was not for the angels that were looking on your situation, can you imagine what the world would be like? Amen. Lord have mercy. Somebody said, thank God for salvation. Moreover, brethren, he said, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. He said, I preached it, and now you have to stand in what I've been preaching. By which also you are, and we are saved. By which also you are saved, if, we, if you keep in memory what I have preached. Keep in memory what I have preached unto you unless you have believed in vain. Now, he goes on verse 3 and says, For I delivered unto you. I know the UPS man might deliver something. FedEx might deliver something. And even the U.S. Postal Service might deliver you something. 
But Paul said, for I have delivered unto you first of all that which I have received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Amen. You got to believe that. Amen. Amen. You got to believe that no other man or no other woman, no other president or leader, no other person that ever lived and died, died for your sin except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. That's according to the uh, what they call the, uh, the canons of the scripture. Verse 4 says, and, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to Scripture. Don't let nobody change that. Don't let nobody persuade you otherwise. He was born, he lived, he died, and he resurrected, and right now he's sitting at the right-hand side of the Father. And he's making intercession for you and for me. Now, we don't think much about that until somebody dropped dead. I had three relatives this week, and one week dropped dead. They found him dead. You don't know when death going to show up. But I do know one thing, we got to be ready. Somebody say Amen. amen. Verse 5 says, and that he has seen Cephas then of the twelve. He saw Cephas first. And then he ran into Jesus, saw the twelve. Now, verse 6 says, and after that he has seen above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. Now, you may read that and say, what are you trying to say? He had to appear to Cephas first, and Cephas received him and told people that Jesus was alive. Then he appeared to the twelve, and then the twelve spread it that Jesus was alive. And people could have doubted Cephas, they could have doubted the twelve and the apostle, but how can five hundred people at one time see Jesus and he be denied? Somebody say amen. It's important that you understand, you know, when people run with a rumor, Come on, somebody. And, and there's some truth to some rumors. Come on, somebody. That's why people start rumors. Uh, they start them on the Internet. Ain't that right? They start them on YouTube. They say somebody died. You look into it and find out that person ain't dead. It's just artificial intelligence. Messing with your mind. But well, wait a minute. He says, after verse 7, he says, after that he has seen of Jesus, then he says, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me. Paul said, he was seen by me. Of all people, Paul saw him last. Also as one born out of time. And for I am the least of the apostles, and that I am not meant to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. He was a forerunner. I'm trying to mess up the church. I mean, think about this for a moment. That man was on a one-man mission to try to mess up the church. Think about that for a minute. You see, the devil going to use Paul, but Jesus had to step in on time. Somebody say amen. amen. He stepped in, and he caught him on the road of Damascus. And he made sure that he knew who he was. So, so... Why prosecute his mouth? Prosecutors down me. And Paul said, who are you? Come on, somebody. Even when he was caught in the midst, he said, I'm Jesus whom thou prosecutest. Jesus had to stop him, but wait a minute. He says in verse 10, but by the grace, but by the grace of God, I am. Come on, somebody. I am what I am. They might not like the way you look. They might not like the way you talk. They might not the way you wear you wear your hair. They might not like the color of your skin. They might not like the way you praise God. They might not like the way you sing. They might not like the way you shout. They might not like the way you walk and carry yourself. 
but by the grace of God. Somebody said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. I am what I am. You can't be nobody else. You can't be like mama. You can't be like daddy. You can't be like the pastor or the deacon. You got to be yourself. And you are what you are. Amen. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Paul said, I know I was in trouble. Paul said, I know I was in trouble when I was persecuting the church. I didn't know if he existed or not. But when I met him on the road, see, many of you don't know it, but wherever you were in your life, you met God somewhere. Amen. You might have met him in the church. You might have met him in your home. You might have met him in your community. You might have been at a revival. You might have been at a tent meeting. You might have been at a sermon. You might have heard about him on the radio. But somewhere you met him on the road of Damascus. And you are what you are only by the grace of God. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. See, some people might not like you because of what you stand for. Some might not care too much for how you dress up and look nice. Some might be jealous and envy of you because you might have this and might have that. Come on, somebody. Uh, but you know you have what you have only by the grace of God. Somebody say amen. You have your home. You have your car. You have your finances, you have your husband, you have your wife, you have your children. You didn't just have children, it was only by the grace of God. My, my, my. And his grace, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. So no matter what you're going through in life, just keep on living right. Amen. He that abide within the Lord shall, uh, shall uh, what, abide and stay under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. And it don't matter where you go or what you're doing, whether you're on the highway, the roadway, the railway, the seaway, or the skyway, God is still going to be with you. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. He that bestowed upon me and his grace is not in vain. Yes. Paul said, but I labor more abundantly then they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. And then in verse 11, before we jump into verse 51, therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preached, and so we believed. Somebody say amen. amen. If you go over to verse 51, he talks about victory. Somebody say, I got the V. I got the C. I'm sorry, I got the I. Somebody say, I got the V. I got the I. I got the C. And the T O R Y. That spells victory, amen. Somebody say, I got the victory. Amen. Victory over what? Victory over death. He said, Behold, Paul says in verse 51, chapter 15, verse 51, Behold, i show you a mystery. What mystery can he possibly talk about? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Amen. Now, wait a minute. Many people will die in Christ and go to the grave. But there will be those that will see the return of Christ. And whether you're in the grave or you're alive, we are all going to be changed. Amen. Amen. How would that happen? In verse 52, it says, in a moment better known as a nanosecond, before I can say second or now, that's how quick the change will happen. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, as the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be risen, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall put on incorruption, and this mortality has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death! 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 Where? Huh? Death has swallowed up in victory. Death has been done away with. There will be no more sting of death. There will be no more sickness or affliction. No more problems in your back. No more problems in your mouth. No more problems in your head. No more problems in your spirit. No more problems in your finances. No more problems in your family. No more problems in the neighborhood. No more shooting in the neighborhood. No more killing in the neighborhood. No more sickness in the neighborhood. No more disappointment in the last day. Somebody give God a break. Death is running. And he's running with a note. He came by the Neil family. And he dropped off three notes. He took people out of here. But one day, when it's all said and done, we can say the victory. Death, oh death, where is thy sting now? Oh grave, where is thy victory? Why? Because those that died in Christ will be resurrected. Somebody say amen. Don't you want to be a part of the resurrection? Raise your hand. Y'all children, young people, raise your hand. Say, I want to be a part of the resurrection. See, people don't get the question to ask today. When you die, are you going to heaven? I don't mind asking that question even at funerals. Because now, when people at funerals, they're sobbing and they're thinking. And their minds are wondering. And they're concerned. Uh, did this person in the castle go to heaven or hell? Come on, somebody. And it ain't my choice. It ain't my decision as a pastor. Because God has a final say-so. Come on, somebody. It ain't what I think or what you think. Whether that person die and go to heaven is what God thinks. And I say to the people, you may condemn him and say things about her while they're laying in the casket. But if you show up in heaven and they're there, they're going to ask you, what you doing here? The same way you may be looking and say, what you doing here? Come on, somebody. Because we know some people, we figure they ain't going to heaven. Come on, somebody. Think about that for a moment. But he says, death, huh, death thought he had the power. See, when Jesus came, he had victory over death. That's why he died and rose again, that we might have the victory in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. I don't want to be uh, pessimistic, and I don't want to be uh, negative, but we all going to live and die. Give a 100 years, everybody in this room, come on, somebody. Amen. Even the newborns, come on, somebody. Amen. Sooner or later, time is going to come knocking. Come on, somebody. The most important thing is be prepared and ready when it comes. Because when people get up in the morning, they, go, they don't say, I'm going to get on a plane and this plane going to crash and I'm going to die today. No. When they get on the expressway and they drive it in the morning commute, they don't think when they cross in the land and they think they can be a flash flood. Come on, somebody. And when they're down the creek with the water, they roll. Come on, somebody. People today take, make all kind of foolish mistakes. They're going to go out on thin ice knowing it's going to break. Come on, somebody. You see it all the time. You see people go out, the dog go running out on the ice, and they go running behind the dog. Then when they break through the ice, who do they haul? Come on, somebody. And some people don't come back from that. See, we don't use a lot of common sense today. But he goes on in conclusion. He said, oh, Deb, where is thy sin? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? See, the sting of death, the sting of death, the sting of death is sin. That's why people look funny when they're in sin. They got that sting on them. Have you ever been stung by a bee or a haunted or a wasp? Anybody? Come on, somebody. I, I've been stung many times. I can't tell you. But I'm here to tell you the sting of death is totally different. The sting of death 
is sin. And the strength of that sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He has given us the victory. That give us the V-I-C-T-O-R-Y. To our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, my beloved brother, be steadfast. Somebody say steadfast. Somebody say unmovable. And somebody say always abounding. In the works of the Lord. For he said, for as much as you know that your labor, that your laboring is not in vain. Not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Amen. So there are times in our life we got to put our shoulder to the wheel. Somebody say amen. amen. If you want something done, you got to put your shoulder to the wheel. You got to work at it and you got to be, everybody say persevere. persevere. See, when you're persevering, you're not going to let nothing stop you. Amen. When you're persevering, you're going to overcome all the obstacles. Amen. When you're persevering, you're not going to let anything get in your way. Amen. When you're determined to accomplish something, you're going to persevere. Amen. Somebody say persevere. persevere. Somebody say persevere again. Persevere. You see, we are what we are. Amen. Paul said, I am <laughs> what I am. Yes. Uh, people might not like you. If you am what I am. Amen. Come on, somebody. Because today people want you to agree with them Amen. even when they wrong. Amen. People want you to be on their side even when they're living in sin. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Oh, you don't know we're living in perilous times. And I, I want to go back a moment and reach back to a man that all y'all know by the name of King Hezekiah. Amen. Hezekiah was one of the Greatest kings in Israel, along with David, along with King Solomon, along with Josiah, Asa, and King Jehoshaphat. Come on, somebody. He was well beloved, and he obeyed God. When he took the reins, he got rid of all the pagan shrines of worship. He got rid of all the devil worshipers. He got rid of all the places that they set up to worship idols and enmity. He established the kingdom for the glory of God. He brought back the feast. And whenever he was in trouble, he called on God. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. And if you know anything about Hezekiah, God always brought about a divine intervention. Everybody say, Lord, thank you for your divine intervention. You know what that means? That means when you're going through something, something about ready to happen, and you cry out, God step right in. Amen. Somebody say amen. 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 And it's divine because you can't do it on your own, but God can. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Well, this man, this king, Hezekiah, who feared God and obeyed God, uh, God was going to use him because at the time, the world power was the Assyrian. Now, let me tell you something. Y'all heard about him. But some of the most notorious villains and wicked people that was on this planet was the Assyrians. When they went in to capture a nation, they would cut off the man's feet and cut off the man's hand. They would pluck their eyes out and cut their ears off. They were so mean, they would cut a captive stomach wide open and put a cat inside that would scratch the man inside. If that ain't wicked, I don't know what wicked is. They would cut their heads off and set their heads up on a spear and let the world see. The Bible said when they attack, the Bible said when they attack, they attack like packs of wolves. They would, sound, they would surround their prey and devour the enemy. Well, if you know anything about Hezekiah, he was a, a God-fearing man. And he had already whooped a million Ethiopians. And God uh, had him in a place down in Jerusalem and Judea for a purpose. But when the king of Assyria came to take over Israel, the northern tribe, he also wanted to come down to Jerusalem. And he defeated 42 cities that surround the outskirts of Jerusalem. 
But when he decided to come down to Jerusalem, then God intervened. Come on, somebody. You ever been in a situation and you was in trouble and God stepped in and intervened? So I'm here to tell you, Jehoshaphat was in trouble. Wait a minute. When this man heard that this king of uh, Sennacherib was coming down, that he went and prayed, and the Bible said that God spoke to Isaiah to go tell Hezekiah that though he may come down and though he may try to destroy Jerusalem, that I'm going to turn him around. God got a way when the enemy comes after you and your family, if you pray faithfully, God will turn him around. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. What are you saying, Pastor? Well, the Bible says that God will protect Jerusalem for David's sake. In the same way that never, this man, uh, Hezekiah, cried unto God, he will send the king of Assyria back the same way he came. Now, wait a minute. This man was so evil, he wrote out a letter and sent it all the way down to Hezekiah and said, you think the God you serve? It's going to protect you from me when I didn't destroy 42 of your cities and I'm coming for Jerusalem. And the Bible said when Hezekiah got the letter, that's like the letter you got today. When you write your petition before God and you put it on paper, come on somebody, and you turn it to the Lord and bring it before him, see no God step in your situation and bring about divine intervention. God got a way of fixing it for you. Even when you think things are not working out right, God can step in at the last moment. Amen. Somebody look around and somebody say, won't he do it for you? My, my, my. Now, you know, uh, the king decided to come down. Now, listen to this, saints. God can change things around so quick and make your head spin. He can flip the script. Now, remember, Hezekiah was a blessed king, and he obeyed God, and great things came to him. But then, when the king decided to come down, the king was sent to come down, the Bible said, in the night when he planned to come down to attack Jerusalem, Judea, the Bible said, in one night, God sent an angel among the nation, and God killed 185,000 men that came against Israel. One angel. The word said one will put a thousand to flight. But when you touch hands and agree with somebody, grab somebody by the hand. You children grab somebody by the hand. And said if one will put a thousand to flight, then two touch and agree will put 10,000 to flight. Whatever your enemy trying to do, he's going to be bound in the name of Jesus. Give God the praise and give God the glory. So Nazareth woke up the next morning. All the men that came to fight was laying dead. You know how God killed him? He killed him with what they call the bubonic plague. It's that same plague that killed millions in, in Europe a hundred years ago. That plague of the coronavirus killed hundreds of millions of people worldwide. People don't have no idea. They still tell you, don't worry about it. Get your flu shot. Get your corona shot. You'll be all right. Come on, somebody. But all that disease is laying dormant. And it's waiting for a moment to reoccur. Come on, somebody. I ain't just telling you something because it's just happening. It is the times that we're living in. If, if love and wars won't change people, if war wars won't change people, if diseases won't change people, then what will God have to do to get people down on their knees? Now I know you want to hear a different sermon. But the love and forgiveness that God has for you and I is the crown jewel of salvation. 
God will crown you with salvation. But we got to be on the Lord's side. And this man, Hezekiah, when he saw God fight the battle, not only with the Ethiopians and also with the Assyrian, he got kind of proud in his heart. Don't let your success go to your head. Come on, somebody. Look around at somebody and say, don't let your success go to your head. See, God will give you success. But sometimes when people are successful, they get proud. But how you combat that proud is, is that you stay humble. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. You see, everything that you got, God gave it to you. Amen. And even though you got it, you can't take it with you. Amen. And even if you could take it with you, where are you going to put it? Amen. Somebody talk to me now. Amen. So you might as well enjoy it and appreciate it while you got it. But, but be there to be known. That whatever you got is going to be left for somebody else. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. You see, love and forgiveness is not only the crown jewel of salvation, but if we receive it by faith, it is a gift of grace. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Well, can you imagine God has been intervening for this king? Every time somebody went to come to fight against Israel, the southern tribe of Judea, or Jerusalem, because it was a split kingdom at the time. Now, uh, you see, Sennacherib, he already destroyed uh, northern Israel, and he captured all the land. And he bragged about uh, his victory over the people of Israel because nobody could stop him. And he had a nerve to tell King Hezekiah, your God can't stop me. He forgot who he was dealing with. Sometimes you got to tell Satan, you forgot who you're dealing with. Sometimes you got to speak it into existence and let him know, I got the victory in the name of Jesus because he gave me victory over death. You don't live but once on this planet, so you might as well live both. Come on, somebody. And live without fear. Because things going to happen. And it don't matter what happened in your life. It's how you come back. Come on, somebody. Every great boxer that ever fought, and you can ask May Weatherfield. That ain't his name? May May Weatherfield? Huh? Who won 50 bouts? <laughs> how you knock out 50 million? I mean, he was knocking him out left and right. I thought Muhammad Ali could knock him out. I, I thought, what's this crazy one that bit the guy ear off? See, y'all know what I'm talking about. They, they were knocking him out left and right. But every time a boxer got in the ring, there was always that potential of getting knocked down or knocked out. But when he got knocked down, he had a count to what? Ten to get back up. You got a count on you that whatever you're going through, to get back up and get back in the fight. Don't let nobody knock you down. And whatever you do, don't stay down there and get back up and get back in the fight. My, my, my. See, Hezekiah got pride. And that pride that he got, you might not know it, but the pride he got turned into balls. He got an illness in his flesh. And the Bible said he was on death door. And God spoke. To Isaiah said, go tell Hezekiah, get his house in order because he's not going to live, but he's going to die. Now, that's, that's tough to tell somebody because when we visit people in hospitals and in their homes and they're going through, we don't want to tell them they're going to die. We want to tell them something good like they're going to live. Now, wait a minute. He didn't bite his tongue. He didn't stumble at his lip. He told Hezekiah, get your house in order, or better still, set your house in order, because you're not going to live, you're going to die. Now, wait a minute. I thought about that for a moment. And the Bible said, when Isaiah told him that, the Bible said that Hezekiah, who was on his sickbed, turned his face to the wall. 
And he began to pray and remind God that he served him and that he lived right. Amen. And the Bible said that his tears come streaming down. Amen. Amen. Now you might not know this, but when I looked up the word prayer and tears, I came up with this example. Prayers up and down and tears sideways. But they made a cross. And that cross when they were laid before him, oh, y'all don't want to hear this. You see, it's important to understand that when you pray out and you cry out, God said, even in your tears, I will not despise what you're going through. God said, I'll be with you. I'll bring you through. Let's keep on praying. So when he prayed, the Bible said before Isaiah went through the second war or the middle war, God stopped him and he said, what is it, Lord? God said, go back. Go back and tell Hezekiah, I heard his prayer and I've seen his tears. And when prayers and tears are mixed together, it will bring you to the cross. And let me tell you, it will be a change of heart. Everybody say prayers. Everybody say tears. Prayers and tears. Come on, somebody. Are y'all with me on this? You see, I know I'm strange, but that's all right. I am what I am. Come on, somebody. Only by the grace of God. And when this man prayed and Isaiah went back and told him, because God heard your prayer, and he knows you live right and walk right, he said, because you prayed and your tears came down, I'm going to add, come on, somebody, 15 more years. Can you imagine 15 years guaranteed? Think about that for a moment. Now, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to keep it real. I had an issue with that. Because in that 15 years that he lived, he had a son by the name of Manasseh. And the Bible said Manasseh was more wicked than all the kings before him. In other words, it would have been better if he went on and died than to have a son that will pick up the ring and undo everything that the father done. Think about that for a moment. But God allowed it to happen. Because God got a way that if we don't obey him, it will bring us into captivity. If we don't obey God, it will bring us into captivity. And that proud spirit that Hezekiah had brought him into a place where he developed a disease. Somebody said forgive. Forgive. And try to forget. You see, love and forgiveness is the crown jewel in the crown of salvation. If we can understand that concept, that we got to keep loving and forgiving even when people treat us bad. Because people are going to do things to you. Look at the media today. We got people that are in charge of the police department. People in charge of the YMCA, teachers, people that ride on airplanes, people that are doing things that when you look at the news, you shake your head and say, these people that lost their mind. They got jobs and positions, education. Come on, somebody. Things that we ain't never seen before, and yet something is happening, and they're doing things. Come on, somebody. That you and I ain't never seen before. These are perilous times. And you and I got to watch over and pray over and anoint over all our children. Somebody say amen. You got to do it. I'm here to tell you, you can't put no trust in people like you used to. Because there's a lot of evilness in the land. And all people need is that opportunity to do their wickedness. The prayer and tears. Now, you ask the question, why did God change his mind? Why did God flip-flop on Hezekiah? God didn't change, but Hezekiah did. 
Somebody say amen. amen. See, God don't need to change. Somebody say amen. amen. And one thing for sure, let me put it down on note. One thing for sure, one thing is clear about his prayer. That prayer makes a difference. Amen. Look around at somebody and say, prayer, prayer. Makes, a makes a difference. You believe that today, put your hand together and give God the praise. Now, can you imagine God that fought all this man in battle? He got proud. You see, pride can quickly enter your heart. Come on, somebody. You'd be surprised how quick the devil want to grab your thoughts and ideas and hold you in a place and make you think you're better or better off than somebody else. Come on, somebody. And you know, when you hold in pride and you hold in bitterness, it can turn into something. It can mess up your uh, equilibrium. It can mess up your digestive system. It can make up your, uh, your, your thinking pattern. It can make up, mess up your heart rhythm. It can mess up your uh, athletic ability. Come on, somebody. You know, all kinds of diseases is not only on the flesh. Some of them are of the spirit. Yeah. <laughs> and most people don't know cleanliness of the mind is a cleanliness of the spirit. And God is trying to speak to you, and people can't understand what God is saying because their minds are cluttered. Yeah. Yeah. Paul said, why stand we in jeopardy every hour? What does that mean? You've seen the program Jeopardy? They give you the answer. you got just to ask the right question. Ain't that right? Double Jeopardy? Come on, somebody. I watch that program every now and then, and, and it's amazing how much knowledge people have of the world and all the different histories and all the different things that they don't know nothing about Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's amazing. Why well, say we in jeopardy every day? Your life and my life is in jeopardy, and we can lose our life at any time. Nobody want to hear no bad news that somebody we love and dear has passed away, but it's going to happen. One thing is clear. Prayer. Prayer mixed with tears will make a difference. Oh, somebody. In conclusion. When Jesus was in Capernaum, going through Galilee, he was always hanging out in that neck of the wood. And he said, these things I must need do. And the Bible said, one day while he was going through Capernaum, he ran into a man that was covered in leprosy. And this man that was covered in leprosy spotted Jesus and fell down before him, and he said to Jesus, Will thou be clean? He was speaking in reference to himself because he was considered unclean. A leprous person today can't go around and say, I got COVID. I got, come on, somebody. There are people that are going to cough in your face or sneeze on you. Don't y'all get mad with me now. And you look at him and say, What? You about ready to fight on the bus. Come on, somebody. You about ready to stop somebody at the gas station. And you ever been somewhere people cough all around you? And you say, what? You ever been in a shopping mall and people coughing all in the aisle? Come on, you left the bread. You didn't left everything in the shopping cart. But you ain't trying to catch nothing. I didn't even know amen, but that's all right. I got some reaction out of y'all on that one. Well, COVID is one thing, but leprosy was so contagious that if you caught it, you lived in a colony where now nothing but leprosy people were. You couldn't hang out with the regular public, and every time somebody came past you, every time you inter interact with somebody, you had to say it aloud for it, leprosy, leprosy, leprosy. Think about that for a moment. If they were to say that today, HIV, HIV, Venereal disease, venereal diseases, COVID, COVID. Lord have mercy. Y'all don't want to hear that. But today, people are that God stuff, and they ain't telling you 
<laughs> I'm sorry. Brother. People got stuff, and they ain't even telling you they got it. And they passing it on like a plate of hot biscuit with grandma molasses. The judge is telling people, if you commit one more crime in this state, if I hear, if you ever, if you commit any crime, I mean, if you ever even kill a snake, I'm going to throw you in jail. What? Huh? Kill a snake. That means that judge won't play. You mess any other creature, I'm going to throw you in jail. The people today are walking, they're smoking blunts and reefer, and they're blowing their smoke, and they're laughing and coughing and hacking, and you can be anywhere in the bank, the gas station, you can be at a dinner plate. Come on, somebody. And Lord, no, you don't want a waitress that said, ah, ah. you said you wanted your steak well done. No, no, I don't want no steak at all. They're hacking and coughing all over your food. Lord have mercy. Somebody say, Lord have mercy. Where are you going with this? This man with leprosy was covered all over. Jesus recognized him. He knew he had leprosy. And the Bible said Jesus reached out and he touched him. Now think about it for a moment. He touched him. And it was unlawful to touch somebody that had leprosy. And Jesus said, I thou be clean. In other words, you're clean because I touch you. And when Jesus was holy, when he touched you, your life will never be the same. The man got up and praised God and Jesus told him, now go show yourself to the priest. And render that which according to scripture that Moses require of you. And Jesus told the leper, Whatever you do, I like this part. Jesus told him, don't tell nobody that I healed. And what I love about this leprosy, the Bible said when he left Jesus, before he got so many yards down, he said, hey, yo, hey, yo, Jesus healed me. Jesus delivered me. How many of you going to shout the victory when Jesus healed you and delivered you from what you've been going through? If you're ashamed of me before man, I'll be ashamed of you before the holy angel. But what I love about this leprosy, hey y'all, in Dudley, Jesus healed me. Hey y'all, in Mattapan, Jesus healed me. Running all up and down the street, and Jesus don't look at him and said, didn't I just tell him? Did Jesus know what he was doing? He told the man not to say nothing. And some people, like many of us, we're like old icebox. We can't keep nothing. But he didn't want him to keep it. Because he knew when God do something for you, I said when God do something for you, when God open doors for you, when God redeem you by his blood, when God heal your body, the songwriter said, huh? I just couldn't keep it to myself. I just, I said I won't go sing no more. I said I won't go dance no more. I said I won't go shout no more. I said I won't go pray no more. I just couldn't keep it to myself. What the Lord has done for me and what he done for you, he can do for others. What he done for mama, he can do for daddy. What he done for my brother, he can do for my sister. My, my, my. You live in a life that has been redeemed. Did you know that? You get a bottle of water. As soon as you drink it and it's empty, there's a five cent deposit. You can redeem it for a nickel. You might not know it, but you've been redeemed by the blood. And there's been a deposit made on your soul. 
The Holy Ghost was your deposit. And you feel that power has a redeeming power in it. To let you know that you were brought with a price. You no longer are your own, but you belong to the Lord. You no longer can claim yourself, but God can claim. Because you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You were bought and paid for at full price. Somebody say amen. Well, if a robin can praise God, then so can I. Somebody say amen. If a bird can praise God, so can I. If a donkey can speak, then so can I. If a lion mouth got to be shut, then I'm going to keep mine open. Because I'm going to give God the praise. I'm going to give God the glory. Well, you can see that old leopard going down the street, looked at his hand, and they were brand new. Looked at his feet, and they were new too. He looked around, and he thought about it for a moment. There was a time when family didn't want me. There was a time when folks didn't like me. There was a time when I didn't have no money. There was a time when I didn't praise God. There was a time when I walked around and everybody laughed at me. But somebody look at me now. I can give God the praise. I can give God the glory. And if nobody don't like me, I'm going to praise God anyhow. I'm going to worship God anyhow. I'm going to glorify God anyhow. I'm going to thank him in the morning. I'm going to thank him in the noonday. I'm going to thank him in the midnight hour. Let's look at what God has done for me. Everybody ought to give God the praise. Everything that got breath in his body ought to give God the praise. Can you imagine if you was in the leopard's shoe and he got delivered? Family said, wait a minute. You were dirty and no good. But he said, look at me now. They looked at him and said, you didn't have nothing and you wore patches on your clothes. But the leopard said, but look at me now. Come on, somebody. They said you didn't have no money and you were always begging. But the leopard said, look at me now. They said you had a raggedy beard and you look like dirt. But the leopard said, but just look at me now. Look what God has done for me. And what he done for others, he can do the same for you. Somebody ought to give him the praise. Praise God. This is Pastor Watkins from Community Revival and Outreach Ministries. I trust that you enjoyed that wonderful service we just uh, had, and I trust the Lord that it touched your heart and your spirit, and it also inspired your soul. But beyond just listening to a message, we also ask you to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And how you do that, you just simply ask and bow before Christ. And if you're willing to lay hands upon your TV or bow your heads right where you are or sitting, if you just bow here with me and we'll pray the prayer of faith. Heavenly Father, we truly thank you for all things in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That you forgive us of all our sins and have mercy upon our soul. And that not only you save us, O oh Lord, from our sins, but, O oh Lord, that you would sanctify our hearts and sanctify our souls as well as, O oh Lord, baptize us with the Holy Ghost and that with fire. We accept you, O Lord, into our hearts and our life. We confess our sins and we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead. And by believing and accepting this, O Lord, we claim to be saved in his holy name. We give thanks and praise for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I trust the Lord that your heart is 
fix with the Lord and that your blessing will be assured and that you'll come out and fellowship with us. And if not with us, your, your own local church in your area and that God will be a blessing to you until we see you again. Take care and God bless. Bye-bye.